Well, good morning, RCA. You got to love Phil, huh? You got to love Phil. Good to have Phil with us. He's with us over the summer, and I uh, thought I'd utilize him. And I'd encourage you, if you are here, stick around for the next service and uh, get into a small group over the next several weeks as well. Uh, some good, good stuff. Uh, you know, Phil looks like he, I don't know how he does it. He looks like he's 17, but he's really 39. Looks, but really 39. <laughs> no, he's not that old, but he's, he's much older than he looks. He just confused me four and a half years ago when I came in. I think this guy's just a young guy, but he has got some season and maturity behind him and ministry experience, and we are blessed to have him uh, be with us here this summer. Uh, good to see you here this morning. If you are visiting with us, especially great to have you here today. And if you have been away for a while, if you've been on vacation, uh, we are just envious, and but glad you are back. And many of you, I follow you on Facebook and see your travels and where you're headed. It looks like some fun, fun times and making some family memories. How many of you remember some family memories as a kid growing up, those road trips? I can remember some of those road trips, and uh, some of the greatest memories I have are on those trips, even in the breakdowns. I remember, this, is, this goes way, way back uh, when I was just uh, probably under five, that age range. We were in a, in a Datsun B210. How many of you, Datsun B210? Not a very big car. We were headed from the coast of Oregon to Bakersfield with no air conditioning. So my parents thought, well, we'll head to Bakersfield, and let's leave it at the nighttime because it's much cooler to drive because once you get over inland a little bit, it's hot in Medford, Grants Pass, and especially as you get into Redding and, and on down to, to Bakersfield. And uh, so we reached, I forget where it was at exactly, but somewhere, somewhere beyond the Oregon border and into California, and the car, I think the engine blew, something of that nature. And so we were on the side of the road, B, prior to cell phones and prior to even phones on the side of the road. I mean, you're just kind of stranded out there. And so my parents thought, well, hey, you know, rather than be in the dark, let's push the car a little bit further under the light. And you know, the mosquitoes were as thick. I mean, we've like got literally ate alive by mosquitoes. It was hot. I mean, just that story is just horrendous. Um, another story, and this I'll have to tell you another time, but we were literally, similar story, um, I think it was a 1966 Ford uh, car we had, I forget what kind of model it was, but it was a boat in big car back in the 70s, and we were literally got over to Grants Pass in Medford, and I'll have to leave you, you have to come back and I'll have to share the story another time, but literally a car started speeding up, got right on our tail. My dad started speeding up. And, you know, these cars, I mean, they're made to run 120 miles an hour. I mean, big cars, V8 engines. And before you know it, we were going over 100 miles an hour. This car was on our tail. I mean, literally, and came up beside us, swerved to hit us. Incredible story, and I'll have to save that for a later time. But I just got to thinking about these are stories, <laughs> memories, vacation stories. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. <laughs> this is my, the clock's not started, so this is not, this is free bonus time here. Free bonus time. So we were in this 1966 Ford, wasn't a Galaxy, but, you know, big, big car, two-door hard top, um, really a nice car, actually. And so we're heading out, and this was years later, and finding ourselves in the same situation, no air conditioning. Who has air conditioning on the coast of Oregon in 1978 or whatever? And we're heading out uh, over at nighttime because it's cooler to drive. But we headed over and got somewhere in the neighborhood of Pass Grants Pass, heading to Medford, that direction, heading south. And literally, this car starts coming up beside us. And so this, by this time, it's late at night, anticipated leaving after my dad got off work, goes much later into the evening. And so maybe, I don't know, it's midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. And this car is right behind us. And my dad had noticed, so most of the family's asleep. And at some point, I woke up, was one of the first to wake up. And this car headlights are just right on our rear. And so my dad sped up. The car's right here. And there's nobody on the freeway. And, and again, so we reached over 100 miles an hour. And the car's right on our tail. And my dad, I remember saying afterwards, he said, you know, if I'm going to get in a wreck, I don't want to be doing 100 plus miles an hour. I'm going to slow this thing down. So we slowed way down. The car comes around beside us swerves and hits us on the side of the car. Then it sped up and took off. 
Well, my dad took the first exit. We got off there. We called, stopped at a gas station, called the police. The police came out, and we said, here's the make and model of the car. And so the police left us there. The police went with my dad. They got on the freeway and went down the freeway. It wasn't even just a few miles down the road, and here was a car parked on the side of the road on the freeway. And so the police were there. They were flashing their lights coming, you know, and their, their flashlights looking on the inside and everything. There was a lady driver, and she's mid-50s. Finally, they tapped on the window, got the lady out of the car. Well, she had been on medication. She was drinking. She had a broken leg, and she was in a cast, and she was supposed to get her cast off that day. And as a result of frustration in medication, she was drinking. She was a race car driver. And so <laughs> the summary is this. She literally thought she was racing cars, swerved and hit us, and they took her in, obviously, to the police station. My dad, they came back and got us, went to the police station. When she finally sobered up at 3 or 4 in the morning, she says, I am so sorry. I have kids, kids as well. I would just be appalled if that... She had no recollection of what she had done at all, at all. So needless to say, they, she says, you know what, I'll, I'll pay you. You guys need to get a hotel. And we were so, like, just frazzled and just the whole experience itself, we just ended up kept on driving till I don't know when because it was such a traumatic experience. Those are memories, <laughs> vacation <laughs> memories, <laughs> vacation memories, yes. And uh, believe me, there's more of those. So just be around my family any length of time and you will uh, have stories to tell for quite some time. Well, if you have your Bibles and you'd like to turn them to uh, Judges chapter 13, we're in a second week in a four-part series we're called Running with Giants. Running with Giants. How many of you ever feel like you're running with giants? Meaning that sometimes they're just way too, too big and they're way too strong and they're way too capable of doing what you could do, and you just feel like, I'm running with giants. I have no business competing with, with these individuals. Well, what this series is focusing on is running with giants and giants of the faith. Giants of the faith in Hebrews chapter 12 is kind of our key verse, and that key verse is the fact that, that running with giants means, and, and it recognizes, the giants of the faith. And the giants of the faith, as we look back in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. In Hebrews chapter 11, we find that you get some of the, the heroes of the faith. You're talking about Abraham, and we talked about Jacob last week, and you talk about Noah and Moses and David. These are people of the faith. And literally, they talk on and, and share in, in this passage of Scripture, saying they're there to cheer us on. They're there to just, like if they were, could be visibly today, they would be in the stands, in the stadium, and watching the race that you're running. And it's a long-term race, and they're saying, you can do it. Keep on going. Keep persevering. Keep pushing on, because you can do it. And they are literally there to give us that type of encouragement. And so it's not running with the giants and saying, you know what, I can't compete and I can't be the kind of giants of the faith they were, but what we're really focusing in on is we can run with giants because these people were individuals just like you and I. They didn't have x-ray vision. They couldn't see between walls. They did not have supernatural powers. They couldn't fly, and, and they didn't have these kind of powers that, that you would think of superheroes having and giants of the faith having that we do not have and possess. But they were people just like you and I, people who had the same struggles, the same challenges. Some of them, some of them have horrendous backgrounds, and many of which, many of us, we had never, never do some of the things that they had done and experienced in their life and, and were really wrong. And yet God used people like that, ordinary people who had made mistakes, and he used them in a great way because they were willing to be obedient, trust God, and have the kind of faith to, to recognize, God, if you are directing me in this path, God, if you are leading us in this way, God, I'm believing that you're going to do miracles before me and use me as a miracle worker as a result of the hands and feet in your, in your hands as a result of, of trusting and depending upon God. And so that's what we're looking at today and over the next couple of weeks. Today we're going to look at Samson. 
And I want to go a little bit at a different angle and not talk so much specifically about Samson. And you'll get what I'm talking about in just a couple of moments. But um, let, me, let me just give you just a, kind of a setting the stage. If you went this coming week and you showed up at work and your boss says, you know what, calls you into the office, says, you know what, I, I want to just acknowledge what a great job you have been doing. In fact, I've noticed what a great job you've been doing. Other people have noticed, and, and the supervisors. And, and we as a company, we want to acknowledge the incredible job you're doing. And he hands you, or she hands you, a check, an envelope. And in that envelope is a check, and you open it up, and it's a check for $233,000. Would that be a game changer? <laughs> that, for most of us, would be a game changer. It would be something that would change our life, because who has just an extra $233,000 laying around at your disposal? Well, we find here that, obviously, it would be a game changer for many of us. For many of us, um, you know, we would say, you know, what do I want to do with this money? How could I invest it? I, I want to seek out a, a good financial an analyst, an analyst, and I want to get uh, some insight in how I can best invest this money because it's such a huge amount, and I want to be a good steward with that money and finances, and, of course, after you paid your tithe. U.S. News and Report gives, a few years ago that came out, and it gives the real cost of raising a kid. The average cost of raising a kid is around $233,000, from the point of birth to the point of graduation. If that wasn't enough, how many of you have daughters? You can add 18% to that number. 18%. So some of you sons, you're going to be negotiating for that 18% that you are not getting that really, in all fairness, should be coming to you as well, an extra 18%. So the same intentionality that we use in investing money, and that $233,000 is a significant amount of money. It's the amount of money that, that you'd say, I want to be a good steward of. Well, what about time? What about time? Time is an important factor that is significant in all of our lives because we're each given, given a certain amount of a lot of time. The Bible says where there's an appointed time that each of us are going to die. We don't know when it is, but God knows the appointed time that you're going to take your last breath, and he knows that time allotment. We don't know, but that's why people who have had near-death experiences, they come back and, and they say, you know what, I'm going to live every day like it's my last day. I'm going to live today like it's the last day. I'm going to treat it with such a intentionality and with such purpose because I know that tomorrow is not guaranteed. In relation to our kids and raising kids, obviously money is an important key to that and it takes a lot of money to raise kids. Time is important because you're never going to get time back and kids are only going to be a certain age and you're only going to have them for a certain period of time. In fact, there's an app that you can download called Orange. And you can literally plug each one of your kids into that app and put in their birth date, and it will calculate how long you have to the day they graduate and presumably leave home. Notice I say presumably. <laughs> so it will calculate it even down to the week. It will calculate it down to the day. Now, my wife, she wouldn't want to know any of that at all. and Because I'm the kind of person that, you know what, we have two more years with Jansen. We have two more years with Janelle, and then they're off, and everything will change. They're like, why do you think of that? I don't want to know that. I, I want to enjoy things now, but, but I'm thinking, wow, I've got this amount of time. I need to utilize it to, to our best, and the time and investment we have with our kids is so important and so valuable. And so we're in this series, Running with Giants, and talked about some of the giants of the faith, and today looking at Samson. But we're, here's where I want to take a little bit of a twist, and not so much focus on Samson, because when you read in Judges chapter 13, it starts out, and it starts talking about Samson's parents and the birth of Samson. And so today I want us to look at more so the investment and our responsibility as parents in raising giants of the faith. I want to run with giants, and I want to have the kind of faith that would be the, similar of that of giants of the faith in the Bible, but I think as much as that is of importance is, it's as great or more importance that we are raising kids to run with giants and have giants of the faith. 
So you're saying here this morning, well, I don't have kids and I can check out. Well, as we've talked about in our, in our generation series, Generation Z, you know, we have a responsibility to invest in the next generation. And maybe there's people you can invest in in your workplace. People who are, are you see an up-and-coming person and say, you know, that person has very much the similarities that I had when I first started off in this role, and I'm going to kind of just take them under my wing, and I'm going to give them some of the knowledge, some of the insights, and the wisdom that I know they won't have, but I do have, and I can impart to them. So there's something I think we can all gain and utilize from even this message today, whether or not you have kids. So as much as I want to run with giants of the faith, I want to raise giants of the faith. He, Judges chapter 13 and verse 2. It says, A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless and able, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Verse 4, Now see to it that it, you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you not eat anything unclean. You'll become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor, because the boy is, a, is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The first thing that we see that these parents are going to be asked to do is to raise their kids with a certain guidelines and boundaries. Our kids, and as us as parents, whether it's kids or whether it's somebody you mentor, whether it's somebody you're coaching, whether it's somebody that you works for you, everybody needs boundaries and guidelines. They need boundaries and guidelines. And so as a Nazarite, they would raise their kid without cutting his hair, not to eat of the fruit of the vine or anything unclean. It was this this was the way that they were demonstrating to God, we're going to raise this child to follow after God. And the point is not to look today to the specific boundaries or guidelines that they were instilling in their kid and we're to follow that specifically, but if we're going to raise giants of the faith, we have to have some boundaries set up. There has to be guidelines, there has to be boundaries set in order for our kids to be the kind of kids that, that God wants them to be. I read of a true story and I don't know whether this was a social experiment, but certainly one of which that could be viewed as that. School district was building a new playground at one of their schools. And so this new playground, it included some of the, the things that you would expect it to be included. They had a swing set and they had slides and they had a jungle gym and, and the teeter-totter and some of the basic things that, that a school you would expect to have on the playground. Well, they also had this playground, but they also had a football field as well. And what was unique, though, about this situation is, is they were right next to a busy street. Well, the playground was here, the football was, field was here, and so, believe it or not, they felt like it wasn't necessary to put up a fence because there was enough boundary between the playground and the street that they thought it wouldn't become an issue. Well, they opened up the playground after it was completed and the kids went out. And believe it or not, the kids were kind of just, they, they were kind of causing a lot of problems. The kids were kind of hovering around the teachers. They were not really going out and just playing and having a great time. And what they come to realize was, is the kids needed boundaries. They needed a fence to be put up. And so the, the social people, as far as like looking at it from a social perspective and, and understanding the human behavior, what they discovered was, is these kids, they not having the boundary, not having the fence in place, and if you were to ask the kids and to say, hey, what would you want in a playground, you're not going to find one of those kids to say, hey, would you put up a fence? Would you put up some boundaries? But yet unconsciously, Without that fence, there was a sense of unsettledness, there was a sense of, of uncertainty, and, and there was fighting, and there was just all these things that began to happen. But those kids, once the fence was put up, the study was kind of showing and, and depicted that once the fence was put up, it gave them a sense of security, it helped them know where they should be, and, and the boundaries were set, where they could go, where they could play, and there was a greater sense of freedom and just fun the kids had aside from previously not having the boundaries set up. And so if we're going to raise giants of the faith, there has to be some boundaries. There has to be some obvious guidelines. 
And so the difficulty comes in this. It's a wonderful thing that all kids, they come out the same prototype, the same personalities, the same temperament, right? <laughs> Couldn't be farther from the truth. I mean, a difference between night and day. And I've given you some, some of my personal stories about some of the challenges uh, of raising kids and the difference between night and day. My son, Jansen, 23. My daughter, Janelle, 21. I mean, male and female, that's enough differences there. But they are as different between night and day. I mean, Janelle, it's just, if we we're on a family vacation, we say, hey, yeah, we all want to go here, and meaning, you know, the three of us. And it was like, it, to spite us, she would say, nope, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, Janelle, come on, quit being so difficult. I, I don't want to do it. And, and what we learned is, is that she wanted to have a voice. And if she felt like we were all siding over here, she was, in spite of what she wanted to do, and maybe she wanted to join us, she was going to just prove a point that she was going to be heard. And from the very get-go, I can remember as a small little girl, and, and again, differences between Jansen and Janelle is, you know, some kids, you just look at them, and, and they just, like, are stand to attention. And other kids, you could beat them every day, and it wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> I can remember, I can remember my dad saying this, and this is after we got older, and, and both of my siblings, as I grew up, were adopted, and so... That's a difference there in itself, but my, my brother was five years younger. I had a sister 10 years younger, and my dad, I mean, he reached a point, he says, I could beat Troy every day. And again, talk about beating, you know, in the 70s, beating was just a healthy spanking, right? Right. It was okay. Yeah, yeah. And he said, I, but he goes, every day he's doing some things that are so wrong and so wrong. And so the point, you can, you can literally tear down a child and just because they're doing wrong every day. And so I can, I can relate to that because there, there has to come a point where you say you pick and choose your battles and some of the things are just not healthy just to be on them every day. And so you pick out the big things, the things that matter. And I can remember raising our kids, Jansen, you know, I, I could tell him this, Kim would tell him this, and for the most part, he was compliant, or he was just better at being more secretive and not getting caught, which I think was probably part of it. Yet Janelle, from the get-go, I can remember being so frustrated. This is when she was in diapers and walking. So frustrated with her, I said, you better take her. I'm going to go to jail. If you do not take her, I, I just, I, I've never been so frustrated in my life. And it continues on. Then she became a toddler and then elementary and then a teenager. And I know I've alluded to this before, but she is going to make somebody, I mean, the best lawyer. I mean, she is the best person. I mean, you want to go to bat. And if she is on your side, there is nothing that will stand in the way of her going to your defense and just holding the line. She's a lot like her mom. No, probably a lot like me. Very strong, very opinionated. But I can remember just thinking, man, there's a difference night and day. And so you have, to, you have to discipline different. You have to raise them differently. And this is where I throw in my two cents here in discipline is this. The Bible says, spare not, don't spare the rod and spoil the child. And I don't believe, I, this is just my, my opinion, but I don't believe that we have to necessarily spank our kids. We have to spank them. And if we don't spank, then they're going to be wrong. I believe this. The point of it is this, is the child needs discipline. The child needs guidelines. And so you could have one child, you just look at them the wrong way, and they're just a wreck. And then another child, you could beat them every day because they deserve to be beat every day because they're just an ornery kid. And so my point is this, is like knowing, understanding the temperament and the personality of your child. That's the heart of it. That's the heart of it. Some kids, I, I think, you know what, adults, I said, you were never spanked, were you? <laughs> you were never spanked, were you? Sure enough. Spoiled, rotten, just, you know, entitled. I mean, it's, it's, you, you get the picture here. But, but the idea is that, that we understand and know our kids and understand the guidelines and boundaries. And so if it's difficult, as difficult as it is to set up the boundaries at an early age and when they're four or five and they're telling little white lies and then they're 13 or 14 and then it kind of shows up at school in junior high and they're telling some lies here and then before you know it they're 20 something and they got their first job and you're finding out that you know well they they told a lie here and they did this and then they're getting married and then they're getting divorced because things are just not true 
Things are not adding up. And the white lies that started off as a small little child and never dealt with continued on even to adulthood. And so you could put in any scenario that might, might be there, but you understand this, that if it's not dealt with at an early age, the behavior will continue. Boundaries when crossed when they're little and not dealt with will become major issues when they get older. If our kids are to become giants of the faith, they need boundaries. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Discipline your children, for in that there is hope. I love this. Do not be a willing party to their death. Don't enable them. Don't enable them. Don't enable them. Here's the second thing. If you want to raise giants of the faith, and and this could be... um, I think maybe looking at an aspect, they need purpose or, and they need challenges in their life. They need challenges in their life. And this is, this is an element that, that um, is so difficult in our world today because we want to shelter our kids from so many things in life because there's so many bad things. And so we want to keep them away from this and keep them away from this. And, and before you know it, we become these paranoid parents that, that we can't go over here, we can't do this. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I mean, you know, we used to, to play out till, you know, dark until, you know, when the street lights came on, that was our cue to go home. As long as we stayed in this 10 block radius, you know, we could just, it, things were different and, and we didn't worry about this. You know, my mom didn't have sanitary wipes. I don't have any twitches or anything, any, anything strange. I mean, there may be a few things Kim would tell you, but... For the most part, there was no sanitary wipes. It was spit. It was spit and spit and, you know, wiping this and putting your, your, your hair that was sticking up. And so I, I, it's just unbelievable that we even came out and survived early childhood. And you've heard me mention this before. I mean, we did not have car seats. Now you have eight point, points of context car, context car seats, connection points, that, I mean, it's just like, I mean, these are, I mean, now you're wearing a helmet in the car. I mean, just <laughs> crazy stuff. We're going to keep these kids safe. And then the fact that we didn't even have seat belts. And you're driving around in this boat with this bench seat with armor all on it and just slide from one side to the next. I literally, I can remember this. Traveling on vacations, and some of you can't even fathom the size of car that we're talking about here, but I mean, a bench seat, you could sit four across the front easily. Back seat, I can remember getting up into the deck, back portion of behind the seat, and lying, laying up there in the wind, that portion right there. How many? Small, right there. No seat belt whatsoever. And so, obviously, there's... There's importance to having safety. There's importance to having these things in place that we think, how stupid were we? How stupid were our parents? I mean, our our world, it took us that long to figure out in this big old car that you get in a car. I mean, it's like like a pinball machine. Kids just, you know, because it's so big and there's no restraint. Chapter chapter in, in verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 5, it says, it says, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The angel of the Lord speaking again to his parents and telling the purpose and the challenges that he would face, that he would be delivering the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. I, I believe this. The angel, with not so many such words that we might use today, is saying, your son has a divine purpose. Your son has a divine purpose. There's something special about his calling in his life. And he's going to lead the Israelites out of of the bondage and the oppression from the Philistines, and he's going to be the man. And what you're going to discover as you take a closer look, as we look at these giants of the faith, is you're looking into their lives, as I've already referenced, these people were not supernatural heroes. They did not have capabilities that we do not have. They have the same resource and the same availability to a supernatural, miracle-working God that we do. The same presence, the same power that is available to them is available to us. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives. And so, but what they did have, these giants of faith, they had a purpose. They had a higher calling in their life. If you really believe you have a divine calling and a purpose in your life, it makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. 
it changes how you get up in the morning. It changes how you, how you look at your work. It changes what you do with your time and how you spend your time and what your priorities are. I was thinking this just a couple days ago. I was going to the mailbox, and I don't know why this crossed my mind, but you know, I was thinking of an individual, a family member, and, and again, not to pass any judgment, but, but I'm so grateful that God is, has, I'm, I'm blessed because not only am I a believer, I'm a pastor, and, and I get to, to be in the double kind of dipping kind of blessing because I'm a believer, which we, every believer, has a purpose. We have a calling regardless of our vocation, but I have not only a believer, but I have, I'm a pastor and helping people, other people come into their, their purpose and their, their direction in life and, and helping people recognize it's not about me. It's not about you, but it's something greater, and we have a, such a short span to live. And one of the things that, that I, I love, though, is the fact that, that with that purpose and with that calling, it, it prioritizes my life, my day, my week, my month. And, and I crossed my mind, this one individual, and I, I thought, I wonder what their life would be like or was like. They've retired now. They had a job. They'd go in and punch in, punch out, day in and day out. And, and their job was to maybe do this position at their workplace, and it was maybe delivering, you know, just within that whole environment right there. And, and you know, life like that, punching in and punching out, it doesn't matter what you are or where you're at and what stage of life, God has called you not to be first and foremost an engineer. God has called you not first and foremost to be a teacher. He's not called you first and foremost to be a sales representative. He's not called you first and foremost to be a, be a, a, a retail clerk. He has called you to be a child and a believer and a follower of Christ first and foremost. And so you just happen to be an engineer who's a believer. You are just so happen to be a sales representative that, that is a follower of Christ and just so happens to be this or so happens to be that. First and foremost, God has called you to be a follower of Christ and with that comes with great purpose and intentionality to have how we should live our life. You know, if I were to ask you to list the top five worst jobs in America, top five worst jobs in America, what would be some of the top five that would be just worst jobs? What is it? Customer service. What else? Sanitation. Yes, some of the, the you've, have you seen that show? I don't know if it's on any, any longer, but it is like the worst jobs in America. I mean, dirty jobs. Yeah, just some nasty, dirty jobs. You think, who does this? And, and you think about sanitation. The garbage person, I mean, that shows up early in the morning and I'm every other Friday, I am jumping out of bed like, like the house is on fire. I'm running out, barely getting some shorts on, getting my, getting my garbage out to the curb, trying to make it in time for the garbage man. He's there at the crack of dawn, picking up your trash and my trash. But I'm telling you, even as a garbage person, you can be a garbage person just so happens to be a garbage person, but your first priority is you're a follower of Christ. There's a purpose and intentionality in which you get that garbage, a purpose and intentionality of how you do what you do, and you just so happen to be a garbage collector, but first and foremost, you're a believer, you're a follower of Christ. I wonder how our kids would be different if they saw your life not as a garbage person or a salesperson or, you know, working for this as a technician or an engineer, but they saw you, first and foremost, a believer and follower of Christ who was passionate about the workplace, passionate about sharing his, his or her faith, passionate about getting and going on a missions trip to Nicaragua to change people's lives, and you just so happened to have to go to work every day to provide means for your ha family so you could have food on the table and a roof over your head. I'm telling you, I think your kid's life would be radically different because they would say and wake up saying, you know what, I don't ever want to go punch in and punch out at the clock like my parents with no sense of purpose, no sense of, of destination, no sense of, of a challenge in life. But when they see you passionate and serving God, and passionate to show up on days when, when they're the big outreach days and show up on days when you're going to Nicaragua and you're giving up your vacation time and they see that, I'm telling you, that will motivate your kids better than anything else you could ever do is by allowing 
them to see you passionate about you're a follower of Christ first and foremost. So if you read on in, in Judges 14, Samson was literally on a vacation with his parents, and while on this vacation, which he was out to seek a wife, while on this vacation, Samson killed a lion, and get this, he never told his parents. He's on a trip, never told his parents, oh, by the way, you know, yeah, I just had an encounter with a lion, I killed, killed the lion. I don't know if it was common practice of the day, but, but nonetheless, I mean, this was their son. They were going with him. And what I, I get from this is that the parents gave him space. They gave him space. They didn't hover over him. They didn't hover over him. Kids are safer today than they've ever been. Again, we didn't have some of the things years ago that we have in place today, and it's for a purpose and for a reason. But I'm telling you today, some of you parents, and I've been there, I've lived it, and I've had my challenges of letting go, but some of you need to quit hovering. You need to let go. You need to allow your kids to face some challenges and to face some difficulties and not be the parent on the phone. And I, I know some of you teachers will give me a, should give me a hearty amen for this. What? My kid got a B? Are you kidding me? I mean, my kid, I'm going to call the teacher. I'm going to call the principal. There's no way my kid could have got a B. You're telling me he did what? She did what? That my kid would never be a part of such a thing. Right? Right? You know, there was plenty of times that even if I felt like my son or daughter was in the wrong, I, I said, you know what? I shouldn't even be, we shouldn't even be in this meeting. We shouldn't even be in this meeting here today. And you need to have respect. You need to recognize the choices and decisions you made. Maybe you're hanging with the wrong company, but never would I allow them to see that because they whined and griped a little bit that we're going to go to the principal, we're going to go to the teacher. Obviously, there's moments you have those, those moments where things are just not right and you want to stick up for your kids. But by and large, we hover. We, we, we don't allow them to go through the challenges and through some of the difficulties in life. And then when they get to adulthood, they don't know. They've never been through a difficult thing. I think I shared with you last week that, you know, in interviewing people and looking especially at young leaders, what I want to hear is tell me the challenges you've been through. Tell me what you've been through in, in, in life in general and how you've walked through it and how you face that circumstance in with your faith and how God has sustained you through that. That, to me, tells a tremendous amount because their faith has been tested. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Think of a time when you grew the most. Think of a time in your life when you grew the most. I can guarantee you, probably most of us would say it was a time when I was stretched to my limits. I was stretched in my limits financially. I didn't know where the next pay, where, where the next rent was going to come from. I didn't know where the next, how we were going to put food on the table. Or maybe a, a challenge, maybe it's a physical type of thing. God has allowed something to happen in your life and it's not gone away, it's not been healed. Those are the moments that we grow the most. And if we're going to see our kids become giants of the faith, we're going to have to allow them some space. Allow them to face some difficulties and hardships. I shared with you last week, and I know I'm talking a lot about Janelle, and great thing she doesn't listen to her dad. I'm, he's, I don't think so. But, but she said, Dad, last summer I was eating one meal a day. One meal a day, and inside I'm thinking, oh, man, I wish I would have known. But in, in part of me was saying, you know what? She's a different person as a result. She's a different person as a result. I mean, she didn't know, no longer could rely on overdraft protection coming from dad's checking account to supply her checking account. And that was an epiphany to her. You mean what? That if there's no money in there, it just doesn't get replenished? You're absolutely right. Judges 14, Samson's mom and dad were with him. And you read on in chapter 14, they were, he was looking for a wife. They were involved in a season of his life season of his life, an important season of his life. And let me say this, the, the kids, they need you. They need you. If they're to be giants of the faith, they need you. I can remember growing up as a kid, and, and again, my dad was the oldest of six. His dad was a pastor, uh, first-generation Christian. They got saved. In fact, when I was in Idaho recently, and it's where my grandparents met, uh, we were staying at a hotel, literally at Tubbs Hill. My grandparents met at a party. 
And my grandma was at a um, um, kind of some type of school. I forget what you call it. Um, not a fitting school or a... Um, somebody help me out here. Finishing school. Finishing school. She was at a finishing school. She had went out that night, met my grandpa that night. She was, was you know, dressed, everything. Well, she came in just in time for the person, the lady overseeing that finishing school, to say, oh, Peggy, you're, you're up and you're wide awake and you're dressed. Well, she had never been to sleep that night. She was out with my grandpa. They met that night. They got married. And I know I've told you some of the story. They got married. Here's what I didn't know is they got married, and there was a period of time where they, sep- they had separated. We're going to get a divorce. And it was in that separation time they ba- both came to know Jesus Christ. It came back together. We're married nearly 60 years, pastoring 50-some years. I mean, it changed the trajectory of that side of our family. Then I find out in that area, and this is in Coeur d'Alene, in that area, the blacks didn't have a good name because they were running the bars, they were doing... And my grandpa made a change of trajectory in the course of our lineage and our, our, our family's history because of them following Christ. And so... I grew up in, in, a, in a home where my dad says, you know what, I don't want to be moving around all the time. I want consistency, and I want to just be in the same place. I lived in two homes my whole childhood and literally moved from one house to the backyard to the backyard of the next house on the other street. My parents still own both those houses, and I lived in that house, and that's all I lived in. My mom stayed at home. It was a leave-it-to-beaver kind of environment, but as much as I had of stuff and ATVs and all sorts of things... The biggest thing that stands out was the time. I can remember going hunting every year. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, we'd get up to go hunting. And I think, I don't want to go hunting. It's cold. It's wet. It's raining. And my dad would pull me out. And I felt, I mean, there was an element. I just felt bad. I'm like, I don't want him to go without me. And so I would go. And we'd always go to breakfast before. And I wasn't really breakfast at 4 o'clock in the morning. It wasn't a very appealing, but we'd go to breakfast, and, and then I remember riding in the car, listening to Neil Diamond and Tom Jones, and I mean, just all these eight tracks. That's why they just ring in my head, um, just coming to America. I mean, but I can remember this. I can also remember that we would hunt in the morning, and we would drive, and you know, 40, 50 miles by the time we're up in the mountain somewhere, and so to save gas and, and not to... to drive back and then go back again, we would hunt the late evening hunt. We'd get in the back of the truck and we'd take a nap. And you know, even at 15, I mean, I still, we, I mean, like snuggling. I I know this may be, sound strange. (laughs) Some of you, and, and as family, you don't snuggle. I mean, there's a healthy aspect to that. I mean, there was something that my dad in the back of the truck, my grandpa, when I was pastoring, he would kiss me in the cheek, hug me and kiss me in the cheek. There's a healthy, healthy kind of love. And I'm telling you, those memories of being in the camp trailer, pouring down rain all night long. We're in sleeping bags and farting and smelling and just (laughs) horrible. I mean, and just we would trade off fixing breakfast in the morning and the concoctions my dad would come up with. He just kind of mixed everything together and, and hash browns. And what's the other kind of hash kind of corned beef hash? And he'd mix all the eggs in it with it together. And it was just memorable. (laughs) Quality time. Quality time. There's something about quality time. You can't regulate it. You can't specify it because you just don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know when that moment's going to come when your kids are going to need that that conversation, that dialogue with you. But it's also not just about quality. It's about quantity as well. There's got to be a healthy balance of it all. And you spell love this way, T-I-M-E, with your kids. Last one you're going to expect me to throw out there is they need God. They need God. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord in verse 8, pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. You're not raising giants of the entertainment industry. You're not raising giants of the industry, just whatever that might be. You're raising giants of the faith. Raising giants of the faith. Bring up children in the training and instruction of the Lord. In Ephesians 6, 4. Bring up kids in the training and instruction of the Lord. You are their number one influence in their life. 
either for good or for bad, you're the number one influence. I hear this so often that, um, well, the church, that's what the job of the church is, to teach my kids spiritually. Do you know, on average, our children's leaders, our youth leaders, only get your kids an average of 40 hours a year? And I don't know how they block this time, and it, but it's maybe the time that you have to spend with the kids. You get 3,000 hours a year with your kids. The greatest influence spiritually and the greatest responsibility we have with raising our kids is that we lead them spiritually. Well, that's a lot to put on me, Pastor. I, would, I didn't go to Bible college. I, I didn't go to seminary. I'm not a pastor. How am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to lead and instruct my kids and how I'm supposed to lead them? Some of you have the idea that it's kind of like, you know, uh, guitar lessons or piano lessons. You know, well, you're the expert. You're the professional. I don't know how to play the piano or guitar. I'm going to go have you teach my kids how to play the piano and, and play the guitar. That's not how it works here. The greatest influence, either for good or bad spiritually on your kids, is you. Is you. Let me give you some, just some helpful insights and we wrap up with this. You know, some of the practical things and resources we have um, are, are so invaluable, yet we kind of, I think, sometimes just take it for granted. But those moments, prayer at dinner time, meal time, any meal, prayer at bedtime, you know, it's, it's just, you know, you're, you're trying to create moments where maybe kids will open up and share. But you know what I have found in my own personal life, and I knew it was true of me, it didn't have at those moments we tried to set up and make it happen. But it happened on those camping trips. It happened on those hunting trips. It happened in the car drive. How many conversations did I have with my dad in the car when everybody else was asleep? We're driving for miles and miles, and we would just have this dialogue. Man, those are just moments that was, for me, it was invaluable. Everybody else is asleep. But we're just having this conversation. And those moments, maybe just, it's a trip to the ice cream store. It's a trip just between you and, hey, we're not going to tell anybody else. Don't let your brothers and sisters know. Let's go get ice cream. Come ride with me to the store. I think another aspect here is coming to church regularly. I never, never was asked this in my life. Todd, do you want to go to church tomorrow? Never. Parents never gave me that option. Never gave me that option. Well, we need to give our kids choice and freedom. They need to make their own decisions. And, you know, they need to have the liberty to kind of come into who they are. Really? Do you allow them to do that with homework? Do you want to do your homework today? Absolutely not, because you need to get a good education. A good education is going to get you a good job, which is going to give you a good paycheck, will enable you to live your life. Do you do that with chores? Do you do that with keeping their room? Not at all. And you say, well, well, Pastor, this is life, I mean, life-altering things that could be important. I don't give my kids an option to buckle their seatbelt. It's a life-threatening situation. Same as with the spiritual condition of your kids as well. It's life-changing. Some of this is just take it or leave it. I, I finally reached a point where I've got a little history behind me. I have raised kids, and they're doing pretty well. They've made their mistakes. We've made our mistakes. But I'll tell you this. One common denominator that I have found in my experience when pastoring and talking with other people and families, those families who put God first in their life, who the parents recognize that they just so happen to be this and they just so happen to be that and they just so happen to work in these places and, and yet live their life with purpose and intentionality and see and, and their kids are there. They're there early because they're at worship practice. They're there because they're the children's leader. They're there because they're the youth leader. I mean, they're just there and say, boy, those poor kids. But those poor kids are seeing a demonstration of what it means to be a follower of Christ. They just so happen to be a, a concrete worker, construction worker. They just so happen to be an engineer. And their life is around the church. I can attest to this because my son, when he got into high school, he had been so connected to church and to youth group and to the people in that youth group. And I'm not saying that every kid is great just because they come to church, and, but, but there's some commonality of some healthy family continuity that we all have. We're trying to raise our kids to follow after God. We're trying to raise our kids with a sense of, of greater purpose and not be so selfish and recognize that Christ has died for them and, and that God has a purpose and a plan for their life. 
And I can tell you this, and I, I tested it. I just told somebody this the other day. I said, all I can say is this. When, when the opportunity was there in high school and my kids could have gone left and right and they made some mistakes, but their hub of friends was church. The people they hung out was church. It was a healthy environment. It was a place that said, well, I, I want to hang out with these kids because it, it's good things. And I'm telling you, those who have the biggest challenge in my experience are those, their kids don't go to youth group, they don't come to church regularly, and they are dumbfounded when their kids are not following after God, not coming to church at, you know, 20-something or when they get married. And I say, what example have they had set before them? They were never there. They never experienced it. And I'm not saying that's always the case, but I'm telling you there's a common denominator there. A common denominator. Make it a priority. Be in church every week. And I could go on to so many other different things, and I'll, I'll pause there, but I think you get the heart and, and the mindset behind it is that, you know, where you put your priorities, your kids are modeling. If you're unfaithful at church, kind of in and out, they see where the priorities were. Well, it wasn't important to you. We just kind of nominally went to church. Church will not make you a great Christian. But when you surround yourself with great people who are struggling and having difficulties, who are walking in the faith, who are doing small group together with, I'm telling you, there is, there is a, a sense of, of help and support and strength that will help you be a better family and individual as a result. I want to invite you to stand with me if you would. Today is, um, didn't intend to go a little bit this direction as far as the focusing on the parenting aspect of it, but I, but I think you see the heart of it here is that Samson was a giant of the faith because he had parents who were giants of the faith. They gave him latitude to be who he was and, and experience some challenges and difficulties in his life. They understood that there was a purpose and there was a, a reasoning for who he was called to be and, and what God had called him to be. And I think there's a great, great sense of responsibility we have as parents to identify whether you know it or not, your kids are created with a purpose. God has a purpose. He's got a destiny for them. And as we wrap up here this morning, and I, I want to ask you this question because I, this has been on my heart recently. I shared this last Sunday night at our prayer and worship night. But I know there are, every one of us, we could identify some people that are saying, you know what? They're just missing. They're not coming to church. There's nothing that's happened. There's nothing that's, you know, would be any big excuse to say, hey, they're not coming to church because of this and because the pastor run them off, because the pastor stepped on their toes. I mean, by and large, it's just they're not coming to church because they just drifted away. And I shared and I prayed last week for those people. Maybe you're here today and you have not been here in a long time. Well, we prayed for you because the attitude of complacency and being lethargic and being just apathetic into just the spiritual climate of your life has to be addressed. It has to be addressed. Things are not getting easier. They're going to get more difficult. And when things get more difficult, it's oftentimes we start drifting away and we'll use any excuse we can to separate us from the body of Christ. But I know this as well. Some of you are here this morning Maybe you'd say, and you don't have to lift your hands, but there was a time in your life that you were closer to God than you are right now. There was a time in your life that you were closer to God than you are right now. Love this story, and I wrap up with this. A couple were heading out for a drive one Sunday afternoon, and he got in his pickup truck, and it was, again, probably a 70s, 60s truck, the bench seat all the way across across the front and and they got in this truck and it's faded and the color paint's peeling off in some parts it's starting to rust out and it sounds like it's as old as it looks and as they were driving down they came to the intersection and and came to the stoplight and and here they are in the truck and the husband's over here and the wife she's over here on her side and he looked across the intersection and, and he said well look at there that's a 1976 Chevy, blah, 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 and that's just like ours. And, and he says, but boy, it looks a lot better than my truck because they've restored it and they've repainted it and it just looks, I mean, looks like a brand new vehicle. And the wife, she noticed too, and he said, hey, there's even a couple in this truck, a lot younger than we are. And the wife was just sitting there and she goes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And so being a smart husband, married all those years, he didn't react, doesn't react. He just ponders a little bit. He thinks about before he responds. Before he could respond, he, she goes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He says, what, what? Did you notice that car over there? Did you notice that, that couple? Well, I noticed the truck, and man, it looks great, and they've refurbished it, they've restored it. No, did you notice that couple? Did you notice she's sitting right next to him? And she had her arm around him, and she was kind of playing with his hair and kind of saying sweet nothings into his ear and putting, getting him a smooch every now and then. And this is, this is kudos for us husbands. He was wise. Again, he thought about it a little bit more. He says, guess what's changed? I'm sitting in the same place. Guess who's moved? You have. Every now and then, guys got to get some kind of... Uh, we pick on guys all the time, but they're, hey, some things are just, we do right. I relate this, obviously, spiritually is this. Some of you have wondered why you have been closer to God in years past than you are right here today. Let me tell you this. God's never moved. He's never changed. He's always consistent. He's always faithful. He's always right there. You know, the, the parable of the kid that goes and sows his oats is a story of God the Father welcoming him, him back. God the Father wants to welcome you back. He wants to invite you into his presence. He wants to invite you into a, more of an intimate relationship with him than you've ever experienced before. Would you bow your heads with me?